You are watching a recording of the President's Podcast with Dr. Rudy Crew, President of Medgar Evers College. Medgar Evers is a senior college within the CUNY system located in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. In this episode, Dr. Rudy Crew discusses the Pipeline Program, which aims to seamlessly transition New York City public school students from high school to college. He asserts that education in the 21st century must focus on globalization and collaboration in order for our students to succeed. There is something really valuable about being on the flip side, institutionally on the flip side, on the receiving end of the work you do. And the knowledge that all of us have accrued by virtue of being teachers and principals and on and on and on, the superintendents, the knowledge that we've accrued on that side of the, of the equation factors into the work that we're now doing in this college. Now, the scaffolding for that is not particularly well developed citywide, right? People don't think necessarily about um, how will a kid in someplace in, in, in Midtown, how will that kid go to Baruch? Mm -hmm. They're not, they're, with, with all due respect, mm -hmm. people aren't people. CUNY is not thinking like that. The, what makes this model unique is that not only are we having to think like that, but we're having to build that scaffold. And so if you feel the tug and the angst and the tension in the pipeline, it's because building means that you are going to deconstruct and then reconstruct. And so part of what brings us to this day is the notion that we've had to deconstruct episodic relationships that actually might have existed here and there and reconstruct relationships along a permanent, predictable pipeline of experiences and knowledge and skill development that students need as a way of being able to predictably go to college. Now, I, 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 um, I think about this as, you know, we talk about it as seamlessness, right? But truthfully, the seamlessness is, 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 a, is sort of an art form, right? I mean, that requires people to agree on what will be the experiences of a fifth grader, not only going into the sixth grade, but being prepared for the freshman year of Ben Guerrero's College. That requires agreement around what is the end game for that third grader such that he or she is actually going to be able not just to enter Medgar Evers, but to persist through four years and graduate and go get a job, yeah, right. Yeah. right? So it's causing us to readjust our perspective. And that perspective is something that all of you in one form or another have had in your heart all along. What was difficult was that the only portion of the system you were engaged in was complex enough that it occupied all of your bandwidth just to do that. So you didn't have a chance to think about down, downstream very much. You hoped that there would be numbers of students leaving your school, potentially as middle schoolers or as high schoolers, and they were prepared and on their way. But truly, the data would reveal that we do not, in this portion of the city, we still do not have enough black and brown and poor children who routinely graduate from high school and are prepared to be able to go to college. And this is after God knows how many years of all of our efforts. So the pipeline is really a way of saying, let's try to get it right before we retire. Right? You got one more, you know, as Dean just said, 
you know, this is your soul work. This is this is what you will actually think about when you are retired. <laughs> this is how you'll measure whether or not you 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 had a good life. Now there'll be other elements too, but you're going to want to say at some point in time, I actually fought the good fight. And this is, in my mind, humbly said, based on the data that I've seen over the K-12 world and spanning now directly into college, this is the right fight because it's the building of a new architecture, a new model. And that new model ultimately has to have an end game. And so I want to tell you what in my head is the end game. So, so far, the, the conversation that we've had both internally in the college and in higher ed, I think, overall, but specifically when I was in K-12 as well, the, game, the end game was always about an academic outcome. Can you read? Can you write? Can you do mathematics? Can you critically think? Are you eligible for being able to uh, finish your high school uh, requirements and so on and so forth? None of that is unimportant. So don't let me suggest in, one, any, in any way that that vein of work is unimportant, right? Knowing gerunds and participles, you know, still has value. The issue is going to be, is that enough? Is that enough? And so the bandwidth of, of work that we've all engaged in is trying to get just that academic strand right. And I've enjoyed my time both on both sides of this coin focusing on the instruction, focusing on assessment, focusing on teacher development, focusing on standards, on and on and on. I get all of that. But at the end of the day, when I look at numbers of young people who are unfortunately still in spite of all of that work on the academic strand, still coming to college without a series of other kinds of predictable adequacies, if you will, then I say to myself, we still have to narrow a K-12 world. Our highway was built for the Model T, when in fact these young people are living in a world that is filled with Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And so they're faster, quicker. Their mental capacity is better and deeper than we even understand because we're still somewhat blocked in our perception of their intelligence by virtue of their poverty. And so the issue for me becomes, let's talk about what an expanded bandwidth would look like. And that's part of the work of the pipeline going forward. So <coughs> as Doris was saying about you know, wanting to talk about the elementary level. I mean, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how does teaching, or how is teaching, affected by what we know about brain, how the brain develops? The science, the neuroscience, the work that's been done in areas of brain theory would suggest that there are a number of things that we don't do in K-12, don't do in higher ed, that actually could and should be done more and more in a continuum of P16, All right? So let's just talk, for example, about how the elementary school of tomorrow actually should be a place where students start thinking about the foundations of their language development. Now, I'm not talking about just learning English and being able to use parts of speech. Yes, that's true. I'm talking about being able to incorporate a second language, essentially a third language. Why? Because the brain is more receptive to the manipulation of language at an earlier age than at any point in a, in a person's life. When do we teach it? We wait till you get into high school where we give you Spanish one. Right? It would require some, if you will, internal transformation of the way in which we see instruction. The elementary part of this work is about building that foundation, though. But it's about building it with an eye toward globalism as opposed to an eye toward graduation. Right? So, again, the issues that are driving this conversation are issues that are outside the bandwidth of, you know, most of the meetings that principals and superintendents have. 
and I say this lovingly, but frankly, we were so myopic, and we spent so much time focused on the, did you get your papers in, did you get your form signed, did you get this in, did you get that in, did the institution get to essentially feed off of you all of what it needed for its survival, that the bigger questions really went unanswered. And the bigger question is, toward what end are we actually teaching these children every single day? And I would argue that our answer now has to be much more global in perspective. So whether we're talking about the new work that we're doing now at Boys and Girls High School, where we're now going to have a footprint of this college at Boys and Girls. Why? Because seamlessness means connectivity. And connectivity means courses that used to be thought of as on the campus can be taught in the school by your <coughs> folks, by our <coughs> folks. And we've got to get out of this business, of this siloed notion that mine is over here and yours is over there, because in the middle <coughs> are children who are functionally illiterate who are not ready for coming to either one of our places. <laughs> Boys and girls, looks forward to having two, 3,000 students at some point again. The only way you're going to build that is through collaboration. They're not able to do it on their own, and I'm not able to get the ones that I want on my own. So why aren't we doing what Amazon and Google does every time they want to have some more money? They just simply say, let me buy Whole Foods. <laughs> All right, let me find out who's doing in the service sector things that I cannot do, I'm not good at doing, but boy, you are good at doing. I'm like, I need to buy you. So that's why you can go on Amazon and get you a, a, a Piggly Wiggly hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you can do that now. Education has got to think about collaboration as opposed to isolation. Now, unfortunately, you know, when I, was, when I was serving as chancellor, I never got a chance to really, really get into my, my true love. My true love has been economics. Started out in that area for a long time. Loved that body of work. Really, really, really kind of deepened myself in that when I was in college, and undergraduate school and so forth. Wrote my dissertation on the economics of urban education, on and on and on. The driver for public schools, believe it or not, is not what happens in Albany. It's what happens in Wall Street is what happens in the money market. The reason I got bounced out of here the last time I tried to do something crazy <laughs> was, well, well, it wasn't crazy yet for me, but <laughs> you notice I can be bold on my own campus. <laughs> But, the reason, but the, reason, the reason that was so contentious at the time was that the country was trying to think, the country was trying to figure out, can we create a new model? And if so, is the model predicated on the industry of education as opposed to the pedagogy of education? And at that time, Giuliani said, hey, I want to bet on the industry model. And therefore, let's just create little sectors in this case, he wanted Central Brooklyn of all places. Uh, let's create little sectors in which we actually get an opportunity to create a competitive market for schools. We'll call that a voucher program. We'll give parents the opportunity to get the market share of the schooling that they want, and we'll do it by virtue of getting private money to come in and give you enough money to be able to buy the education you want to buy, and we'll have to be, we, we'll, we will have fixed education. Well, Oh, uh, the only point I actually am trying to make out of that is to simply say that market share still is important even in our industry. Right? Megger does not get the market share of students that we should get given the population density in central Brooklyn. So you ask yourself, if this were an economic model, what would you say is, ro is, wrong, or is wrong? Is it that the raw material coming in is, is, is simply in inadequate? Or would you say there's nothing wrong with the raw material, it's the process by which that raw material is developed. It's one or the other. And so what our argument is in doing the pipeline is there is nothing wrong with the raw material. But there is something wrong with the process by which that's developed. 
There is something wrong with the way by which we take a third grader, and predictably, by the time they are in ninth or tenth grade, they will have literally, in some cases, done less well for each year that they spend in school. And if their first language is something other than English, that prediction even goes up even higher. So I'm simply saying that the pipeline is really all about this sort of phased in look at globalization and how it impacts instruction in the third grade, fifth grade elementary school. And we ought to really ask that question. You ought to stop for a second and ask the question, what would be different about my school? What would be different about my region if, in fact, we had a global-centric um, sort of end game? I'll define that in a second. Second is, for middle schools, the, for the middle school trajectory around this is, if elementary is foundation, middle school is deepening aspiration. It's creating what that young lady said in the video of, I want to go do this. Now our kids, I'm talking about our kids now, our kids live off of aspiration. Mm -hmm. They live off of aspiration. Unfortunately, all too often, their aspiration doesn't match their preparation. But they live off of aspiration. All you gotta do is ask somebody about some team that they like and they'll give you aspiration. The question becomes, at the middle school level, what would it look like if middle school education was actually dedicated to these students formulating clear and crisp understanding of what their real interest is and how did that interest become manifest in the kind of courses and the kind of experiences they get in middle school. Now, I happen to believe that middle school has been all, all too often a kind of a lost art, right? It just it was a wasteland for a long period of time. I, I like what I see in some of the middle schools that, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are represented in the city now. I see a lot of people doing much more project-based learning. I see a lot more service learning. I see a lot of things. But I guess all I'm saying is middle school, the only answer I can give you right now is that there would be much more interactional learning in the middle school than you ever see any place else, right? Because what you've got to do is connect people to the enormity of what they need to do in order to be able to make that aspiration happen. I would see less sitting in chairs and more sitting around tables. I would see more opportunities for students to engage in project kinds of activities and I would see less people doing homework uh, in isolation. I would see much more of teacher collaboration around a whole series of interdisciplinary kinds of work than I would see people simply assigning my English class is my English class and your history class is your history class and never the twain shall meet. Now these are these are almost revolutionary notions in, in, in our world because people have learned the art of living in isolation. You have to peel their cold dead hands off of that behavioral mindset in order to be able to get any of that to really change. But I'm telling you in all honesty, if you do not do this, then you are actually uh, essentially uh, co-signing the existing system. Your name will be on the existing system, which we know produces such a variability in outcome that you don't want your name on that list. You either go to Yale or you go to jail. <laughs> That's how wide the discrepancy is. So it is, it is it's, it's an enormously important thing to think about what middle school education could be in the context of globalization. The, the pipeline actually wants to have that conversation. We want to push that conversation. We, 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 we're not even agnostic about it. I mean, I have some notions about this, as you can tell. But, but, but as, as, as uh, Doris said, I, I, we need to hear from you. We need, we need for you to be able to sign on to this. And the reason is that in high school, that is a time when the rest of the world, and I was in China over, over the summer, I was in Nigeria over the summer. Most of the, 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 most of the rest of the world, when students are starting their secondary world of work, they are, even in the Caribbean, they are actually signing on to the career of yep. their choice. Yep. They're not just signing on into high school, they're signing on to a career. Mm -hmm. 
And whether or not they actually will stay with that career is a whole other question, because everybody changes over the time. But the fact of the matter is, the notion that secondary schools is about preparing people for career development and career placement is really actually kind of where we want to go. Not only there, but in terms of the college as well. Because the freshmen who come to us are freshmen who actually ought to have some sense of what they want to do with their life. Why? Because they're going to pick a concentration. They're going to pick a degree program. They're going to sign up to a school. They're going to be able to take courses that are freshman year foundation courses in that year. And if they are just floating, see, here's what I'm going to tell you is all honesty. Black and brown kids and poor kids, they ain't got time to float. There's no time to float. We act as though we can just simply allow these young people and say it in the, in the best and the most, you know, sort of interesting and, and, uh, and, and helpful ways. We act oftentimes as though you're free thinking, you're free wheeling, you know, I want you to develop and self-actualize. Oh, that's great. Piaget wasn't wrong. It's just you don't have time to do that forever. You don't have time nor money to do that forever. So you really need to come in here with a sense that there are things you both are about. So I can sign up for a class, not because I need that class, but because if that class connects to my, my aspirations that started way back in middle school. Actually started sometime even earlier than that. So the pipeline is going to try to figure out you know, for a, from, a, from a high school standpoint, what is it that, from a global perspective, we ought to be thinking about for students writ large? First language, not English, kids who have special needs, students who are coming here as migrant in, in terms of uh, immigration. Doesn't matter. What is it you want to do? Now, this, just asking that question would change guidance and support dramatically. So it's no longer am I just placing you in something that you need because it's a freshman class. Now I'm placing you in something predicated upon your interests, your motivation. What this young lady said is exactly right. I am motivated to go do this. There is no better reason to get up in the morning than when a student is motivated to actually come to your class. You want Everybody wants that in their school. I'll close and say this. There are, I started by saying that the beginning, uh, at the beginning of this, these comments that this, this, this academic bandwidth is so narrow and we've gotten so fixated on test scores and on and on and on that, uh, that it ignores several other places where I think we actually have to spend some time. And this push toward globalization actually helps me to formulate what are some of those other areas and they are as follows. Number one, we actually have to young, we have to ask ourselves, not only is a kid academically prepared, but is a kid, uh, a young person have the civic literacy that they need as a way of being able to participate in the community of school or in the community of their own world. So there's a civic literacy threshold, right? So many of our kids are getting booted out of schools, not because they didn't do well in school, but because they did something wrong in school. They behavioralized something. They couldn't manage their own anger. They couldn't manage something, right? But the question becomes, flip that and say, well, what would the skill set look like if we actually, what would the day look like if we actually paid attention to young people's civic liter literacy, right? Their ability to belong to a group, their ability to express themselves and to share time and share ideas in a group. Their ability to actually make a friend. Their ability to connect to the larger community to understand what it means to live and thrive in a democracy. What would that look like? What would your school look like? What would your school day look like? What kinds of experiences would your fifth grade, eighth grade, tenth grade student get? How would you grade it? Would you grade it? Are there other assessments that are better than a grade? Go look at your report cards and ask yourself, do we say anything about a person's civic literacy? Third area, beyond academic and beyond civic, there is this notion of occupational literacy. It's what do I understand about work? 
how do I understand how to work? What are the elements of good work? How do I think about working together with other people? Most of us watch the news and then say to ourselves, boy, I wish we lived in a world where people knew how to get along and work together. What are we saying about the world that we're also saying about our eighth grade classrooms? Working together is a strategy for humanizing and creating a more just world, but it's also a strategy for being able to get a job. So we've got to stop thinking about what does it mean to have a sense of occupational literacy. When we were last at, uh, at Boys and Girls, I, I, I had an opportunity to meet some of the, 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 the students who were there, and I was blown away by two things. One, they showed me the, uh, the pantry that they have in the school. I mean, I, then I met a couple of students who, who used the pantry. Right? And the moment that, that those two pictures came together for me, what struck me was, here's a school where the young person in this school is benefiting from this notion of being in a world where their humane uh, treatment for being homeless or being without food or whatever in transition it may be, but where the treatment of them is the curriculum is part of the curriculum of the school. So there's no separate here, right? This is this is this is this is how we roll. You need to eat. Maslow taught you that. You need to eat before you can come in here and do gerunds in my class or whatever. You need soap. And we're not going to, we're not going to make you feel undignified because you didn't have soap. But we're not going to also let that be an excuse for you not to be in my class today. So the standards have to be high. You can't get locked into this notion that, oh, pobrecito, I'm so sorry for you, and therefore I need to basically let you pass. I need to let you get by on a home. No, no, stand up, look at Rex, stand and look at me in the eye, be here at 8.30, make sure that your stuff is ready, and I expect you to understand that because somebody cares for you, you even have a deeper obligation to get this stuff right. So this notion of occupational literacy, this, this idea that you belong to a world in which you can do anything you want to do, that is why I'm talking about the way that this actually has to start formulating in people's mind and being intentional about what middle school education would look like, very differently from what it is right now. All focused on academics, I get it. All focused on preparation, I get it. But at some point in time, somebody got to ask the question, what do you think you want to do, young man? What do you think, you, where are you going, young woman? I mean, where, where, where is that? Now, let's talk about how that gets factored into course assignment, work that you're going to be doing, projects that you're going to be involved in, and so on and so forth. Last and certainly not least, there is this notion of personal adequacy. This idea that every human being Every human being is capable of being innately, permanently smart. And that how that smart person understands and attributes their success. The work is called attribution theory, but truly what this is about is this is about I need to be, I need to be confident in myself. I need to be confident in myself. I need, to, I need for somebody in schooling day, somebody in the schooling year, somebody in my, in my world, somebody's got to help me avoid the negativity that sets in when I fail. Now, I, like you, I've spoken to a lot of students who when you say to them, where are you supposed to be? They say, I don't you know, I don't <laughs> <laughs> And and in many cases, they can't look at you and tell you that. 
I walk through this hallway a lot of times. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> I, I, I think that's the president. And what you can tell their whole demeanor is authority scares the bejeebers out of me. I ain't supposed to have nothing to say to you because I'm not even supposed to actually be here in the first place. This personal adequacy is about giving kids the authority and the license to be good human beings, to be innately worth your time, to be the receptacles of your affection and your love and your counsel and your guidance and your, in fact, huge demand. The, the, the idea here is that these things matter to human development. They aren't just creatures of the day that we accidentally impart. These are how humans develop. Everybody in this room needs to have somebody in authority certify you did a good job. And I don't care how you do it, but you got to somehow or another. The research has actually been pretty clear that when it's done by eye contact, it is best. When it's done with touch, even though you've got to be careful. <laughs> when it's done by touch, mm -hmm. it actually releases endorphins in the brain that allow you to feel juiced. What does that do? What it means is that the next time I ask you to do something at this level, not this level, but at this level, you will do what learners do, which is I will take the risk. Maybe I'll get it wrong, but I have enough confidence because I have this relationship. I have enough confidence that even if I get it wrong, I might get an F on that, but I'm not an F. That's right. Do you understand? This is why I, I, the reading about the brain is a really important piece of, of important piece of research. Our children need somebody who just says, "You know what? You're good. You, you're good. And I'm gonna love you even if you're good enough. But doggone it, don't you come in here without preparing? So we don't have to have that conversation about it. I'm, I keep hitting on you, man." <laughs> <laughs> I get you, Randy. Okay. <laughs> but, but you understand what I'm saying? This personal adequacy is about the ability of our young people to feel love, to feel empathy, to feel that somebody cares enough about them that they matter to a significant caring adult. And that is a cornerstone of human development. I can do anything, get any grade, I can pass any course, fly any plane, do any kind of math, any kind of science, get into any kind of medical school, I can do any of that. If in fact I am forti fortified by people who essentially along the way allowed me to fail in the context of their adoration and love. The pipeline is just simply saying, hey principals, hey superintendents, hey faculty, you know what? There's nothing wrong with telling somebody, I love you. I love you. Now, I don't love the fact that you're poor, and I don't love the fact that you didn't have no soap this morning. I don't love all of that. But we can fix that. That's all fixable stuff. That's all fixable stuff. That's free. And it's free. Here goes some soap right here at the, at the, at the, the, the pantry. Or here, 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 here's 50 cents. Go on down to the figure we can get you, get you a little bar or so. Right? It's not, that's not, that's not a problem. What is bothering me, and I'll close on this note, what is bothering me is that because it's not a problem, and because these other adequacies, the academic, social, occupational, and personal, because these are not complex things to understand, our institutions don't know how to transform themselves such that these become the way by which we understand the toward what end. Mm -hmm. 
This is why a third grader does the work that he or she does. This is why you do in eighth grade what you do. This is why you would change the way you do eighth grade science or math or, sing or, or English or whatever it may be. This is why you would take a foreign language as a requirement. It's not about Bronx High School of Science being able to produce most of the kids who actually end up in the science program in New York City or here at Medgar. Every school ought to be able to produce science based upon a curriculum that would prepare a student who eligibly would be in our science curriculum and around our science degree program. Every single one of them. You've been watching a recording of the President's podcast with Dr. Rudy Crew, President of Medgar Evers College. To learn more, visit us online at mec.cuny.edu.